Welcome everyone to Friday Faith Sharing. Welcome to our final edition of, of Friday Faith Sharing. And I thank everyone who has spent the last year with us uh, listening to these reflections from their family at Holy Cross, these reflections upon God's Holy Word, and being with us during this hard year of pandemic and worry. Today's guest is Sylvia Deck, who is a returning guest and was the, indeed the person who started this whole project out with me 12 months ago. So Sylvia, welcome, welcome back, and how are you? Oh, I'm doing very well. A little, yes, I'm doing, I was gonna say I'm very warm today, but I realized we're, you know, we're recording this a little early and maybe when people listen to it, it'll be nice and cool again. <laughs> yes, this is recorded in the middle of that big heat wave uh, a week ago. So Sylvia, we've gone through a lot together, um, individually and as a Holy Cross family for the past year. Some has been good, some has not been good, but like, end us on a positive note. For what are you grateful? <laughs> that, okay, thank you. That's easy. I am grateful for you. I, I am so grateful, yes, because um, I love too that you invited me to bookend, you know, because I was the first one and then I can end it and I think, okay, I'm the one who's going to wrap up all the, the wonderful wishes and good feelings that people have for what you've been doing. And somebody just said this to me yesterday and I said, oh, that's what I'm going to tell Joe. Exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you for doing so much to empower the laity in our church. Um, the year before we, um, the pandemic started, the, um, Lexio Divina group that meets on Wednesdays after, that was meeting on Wednesdays after mass and it's still meeting, um, hosted a Lenten um, um, series with Father Mike called the Listening Church. And it was a reminder to us that everyone who calls himself or herself a Catholic Christian um, is a servant of everyone who gathers, whether priest or deacon or religious layman or woman, we exist to serve others. And that means, first of all, listening and paying attention and then responding, like, what are your needs? How can we make life better for you? And certainly Holy Cross Church has done that. I'm just so proud of my church. Um, the way the soup kitchen or the, the, the food pantry has responded and COPA, helping people with rents, and the way the church responded to people who had lost their homes in the wildfires. So, Joe, you have really um, been the person the, who encapsulated all of that, you know, just captured all of that, paying attention to, listening to, and so I'm really grateful um, to helping us um, experience more intimacy as we share our spiritual journeys. Um, so on behalf of everyone who has appeared here, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, to, to you, to everyone, thank you very much. Uh, deacons are supposed to be servants. That's what we're ordained to be. That's, the whole, that's what the word means in Greek. So I, my whole... So here's my prayer. This is what I pray to myself so often, or rather to God, so often. God, make me worthy of your people. Because, and I preached this the other week at Holy Cross, what would be, I guess, two weeks ago when this was recorded. But I learned so much from everyone at Holy Cross, not just the wisdom of Father Mike or the dedication of Sister Barbara, but all the people of Holy Cross. And if I can give anything back, it's just what I have already received from you. I think all that is just, you know, speaks to the Holy Spirit present in the people of Holy Cross and um, alive and active in the world. Exactly. So this is a very long gospel, everyone today. Um, so if you are at home, you might want to click pause for a second, make yourself a cup of coffee or a tea, and be prepared to hear a long but powerful gospel about resurrection. It's a good story. Yes. Two good stories. <laughs> if you if you click pause, we will still be here. <laughs> Sylvia Duck, may the Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. 
one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There is a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for twelve years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be cured. Immediately, her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, People from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid. Just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him except Peter, James, and John the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by hand and said to her, Talitha Kuhum, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a, a child of 12, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there are two things that caught my attention in this Gospel. <clears throat> Uh, first, there are obviously two stories here, um, and this is something that Mark does pretty often. He dovetails stories, and the significance of that for us is that um, we're um, called to interpret those narratives as they relate to one another. Um, so let's take a look at how they relate. Um, first of all, the story of Jairus and his daughter. Um, Jairus is well known in town. He's a dignitary. He's a leader of worship at the temple. And so he's not normally someone you would expect to fall down at the feet of another in the midst of a crowd. And this gesture of humility is prompted by his concern, of course, about his daughter. He's terrified of losing her. In the other story, the woman who has suffered for 12 years from a flow of blood is also well known in the town, but not in the same way at all. She's considered an untouchable. 
someone people wouldn't go near because of her condition, she's considered unclean. So she goes into the crowd trying to be unobtrusive, knowing she can be discovered at any time and cast out. So she thinks all I have to do is touch the hem of his garment. And so she too kneels down. Um, so here are two people, both seeking healing, risking dignity, willing to do anything to accomplish their needs. And in their desperation, they aren't afraid to ask for help. So their humility makes room for healing. And the lesson, well, as a recent bestseller puts it, um, asking for help isn't giving up, it's refusing to give up. So let's leave that aside for a minute and go to the second idea that emerged for me um, out of this gospel. So there are two women in these stories, separated by some years, though maybe not as many years as we might think. Maybe uh, I'm imagining the, the older woman is in her 20s because she'd been suffering from this for, you know, 12 years and the other, the little girl is 12. And um, both of them are in trouble, in need of the touch and attention of Jesus. And he responds to both of them without hesitation. He immediately goes with Jairus. He's going to, to do whatever he can to help save his daughter. And then when he realizes that his body has, something has happened to him and he turns, who, what's happened here? And when he realizes it's this woman, he, he's so tender to her and he calls her daughter and tender with a, with a child, little girl. And I, and I love that kind of, of tenderness that just shows how much he's listening to them and paying attention to them. So this is, this is no small thing in the time that Jesus lived because women and children didn't really count. It's um, really no small thing now in this present age that somebody would pay attention to women and children. So Joe, earlier I thanked you for listening to us and in turn giving Holy Cross parishioners a chance to be heard. And I don't know what your statistics are, but it seems to me that uh, perhaps a majority of, the, of those who have responded to your invitation to be here have been the women. And we don't often hear women's voices in the Catholic Church or lay people in, in general. Um, it might be hard for those of us here at Holy Cross to imagine because we've been blessed with pastors who've allowed women in leadership roles to lead communion services and even in the past, about 15 years ago, offer reflections at Mass. This is not the norm for the church around the world or, or even in our diocese. diocese. It's, it's not even allowed, but where it has been allowed, even here at Holy Cross, it's offered not as a right, but a privilege. And that means that it can be taken away at any time. And it has been. So the fact is that those who represent probably more than half of the people attending our churches are not represented in the sanctuary. And I'm not <laughs> the only one saying this, but there needs to be a change. And in many places, it is changing because the laity are becoming more informed about their rights and their responsibilities. Um, they're listening, studying, reading documents, um, asking questions. Like Jairus and the woman, they're asking for help. And they're asking the church to um, help them, to listen to them, and they're refusing to give up. Um, they're asking for a voice, um, for the church to pay attention as Jesus did. So I do have a vested interest in seeing our beautiful church, the church that I love so much, move in the direction of allowing women the right to serve God's people. And I'm saying this out of a heartfelt conviction that my daughters and my granddaughters, my daughters-in-law, and those of my friends deserve to be heard. And I really, truly believe that our Lord 
wants them to be heard. So I thank you for making this happen <laughs> during this last year. And I look forward to a future not too far off, I hope, where a woman in the sanctuary is considered normal and her voice from the altar a blessing. So I'll just end by quoting what Jesus said to Jairus' daughter, to Letha Kum, little girl, I say to you, arise. Amen. Amen. Sylvia, Sylvia, thank you again for your presence, your wisdom, and for your voice. And as the Vatican continues to study the possible restoration of women to the diaconate, let us here in the church in the West, let us pray through one certain female deacon, Deacon Phoebe, that you read about in uh, the letters of St. Paul, and ask for her intercession to, you know, to help us discern the role of an empowered um, female voice in the church, whatever that might look like ultimately. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, exactly. Great. Thank you. Deacon Phoebe, I'll remember that. Yes. Uh, we know this much about her other than the fact that she is a deacon and Paul sends regards to her in, I forget which letter, but in one of the Pauline letters. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at Eastern iconography, if you look at Eastern icons, there, you know, there are certain ways to portray her. So she's recognized in the church as being a saint and being a woman who is a deacon. Right. And, and there's so much going on in our country and around the world uh, around this issue. I've been watching some wonderful um, broadcasts, some, you know, some Zoom meetings, webinars, et cetera. They have them. There's, there's just more and more. They're prol proliferating. And it's just something that's bubbling up. And so I think it's just the work of the spirit. And she is working hard. <laughs> Our hope always is that Christ comes and comes soon. But if another 2,000 years happen in church history, then this time right now will be considered the early church. And so it'll be interesting to see where the Spirit takes all of us now and in the future. Exactly. And so everyone who's been watching for the past year, thank you very much for your time, for your attention, because attention may be the greatest prayer and gift of love we can give to one another. So thank you again for watching and may you have a blessed weekend. Thank you, Joe.